In this evening's discussion, as evidenced by the uh, Shingi, is going to be on William Sergius Bigelow and Ernest Francisco Fenelosa, who were the first Westerners to take Tendai Buddhist vows. And this evening's discussion is explicitly about these two people who were born in the 19th century. And this was a time in the U.S. of peak industrialization, a time of new scientific discoveries, new theories of evolution, steam power, medical innovation, and treatments, introduction to, of electricity, racial disharmony, and rapid expansion of the American domain. Interestingly, Japan was experiencing many of the same phenomena, but in an accelerated pace and on the edge of transforming from a feudal society to a modern one, all within the time span of decades rather than centuries, which was the case in the US. So we're gonna start with a brief summary of the time and social environments in which these events took place and then go on to the subject so you better understand the context under which the Buddha's vows were taken. So today, Japan's a postmodern society and it's perhaps even more hectic than New York City or London or Rio de Janeiro or choose a place. Um, and this modern is, but this particular modernization started in the 19th century. And as you can see in this woodblock print of the early Meiji period, it's in the throes of both westernization and modernization. Several things to note when you look at this, when you look at this photo. The woman and child in the lower left corner are in a traditional kimono. And then there's two Chinese gentlemen in their traditional dress near the woman. And the women and men are in both Victorian dress of the time, as well as the more traditional dress. There's a building of Western architecture, and behind it, a traditional Japanese building. There's an iron bridge and a Japanese castle in the background. The preceding area, era, excuse me, was Edo, the former name of Tokyo, or the Tokugawa period from 1603 to 1867. And the Tokugawa era was the last of the shogunates, who along with the daimyo, the wealthy landowners, ruled Japan. Considered late traditional the period, it was noted for its regulated, efficient, and bureaucratic rule, a period of security and economic well-being for much of the population. It was also a period of stagnated innovation and isolation. The samurai, who had been a warrior elite in the caste system, had been transformed into an urban bureaucratic elite. Buddhism and Shinto were both still important in Tokugawa, Japan. Buddhism, together with Neo-Confucianism, provided standards of social behavior. Seeing, excuse me, seeing the European and American colonization of much of Asia, many of the elites in society responded by rebellions, which led to the restoration of of the Tenno or emperor. In this case, Meiji, a 15 year old boy at the time of, his, of the restoration. Especially important in regard to this evening's topic is that the collapse of the Tokugawa re regime and the wave of changes accompanying the restoration of imperial rule and the formation of a new government at the start of the Meiji period stimulated directly and indirectly numerous significant changes in Japanese Buddhism. The harsh critique of Buddhism by Confucianists, Confucians, Nativists, and Shintoists during the waning years of the Tokugawa period at the start of the Meiji culminated in a state-mandated separation of Buddhist and local elements of worship, which came to be identified as Shinto. Triggering a brief but exceedingly violent suppression of Buddhism lasted until 1871. Numerous Buddhist clerics were forced were forcibly laicized. Monastery lands were confiscated and many temples and works of Buddhist art were destroyed. Even after the overt violence subsided, Buddhists were left in chaos by an end to state support. Among other things, this meant that temples began selling off their many treasures in order to survive. This becomes important as we will see in a few minutes. And it should be noted that during this period of time, many of the implements in the temples were actually just being lost on the curb as garbage, 
lost the way, etc. Numerous Buddhist, uh, I'm sorry, government mandated institutionalized centralization restructuring led to an, the end of state enforce, enforcement of traditional protocols of Buddhist discipline, particularly prohibitions against such clerical infractions as eating meat, marriage, and abandoning clerical dress and tonsure. And remember, those things had been in place for the previous 1100 and some odd years. Uh, since the since before the, since the very uh, beginning of Buddhism in the sixth century in Japan, now we've set the stage for what we're going to see taking place in the 1880s in Japan. This evening, we're going to be discussing Bigelow and Phen Phenolosa specifically, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention two other figures were pivotal to the story about, the two, about these two exceptional gentlemen. So I'll introduce four characters be, before concentrating on the main figures. Next. And then right after that. So from left to right, the first person we're going to talk about is Edward S. Morris, Sylvester Morris to be precise. He was a, an American zoologist, archaeologist, and Asian specialist. He was born in 1838 and died in 1925. He's considered the father of Japanese archaeology. When teaching courses on Japanese history and culture, I frequently consulted his books on Meiji Japan, Japanese homes and their surroundings, to better understand everyday life in Japan at that time. Morris first visited Japan in 1877 to conduct research on coastal brachiopods, a hard-shelled critter similar to clams. His visit turned into a three-year stay when he was offered a post as the professor of zoology at Tokyo Imperial University. And he went on to recommend several fellow Americans as Oyatoi Gaikokajin, four advisors, namely Bigelow and Fenelosa, to support the modernization of Japan in the Meiji era. Of special note, he is also credited as the person responsible for bringing Darwin's theory of evolution to Japan. Next, in from left to right, is the fellow that you see there, Okokora Takuzo, also known as Okokora Tenshin, Tenshin being his Dharma name, was a Japanese scholar and art critic who, in the era of the Meiji Restoration Reform, defended traditional forms, customs, and beliefs. Outside Japan, he is chiefly known for the Book of Tea, and which is also a book of tea, a, heart, a Japanese harmony of art, culture, and simple life. This book first introduced Chado or Chanuyu to Western audience. His book in English, The Ideals of the East, with special references to the art of Japan, a relatively short book, provides in, insight into the intersection of East Asia, especially Japanese aesthetics, culture, history, and philosophy. It's a snapshot of West meets East from the perspective of the Japanese during the Meiji Restoration. In 1906, he was invited by William Sturgis Bigelow to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where he became curator of the Department of Japanese and Chinese Art in 1910. On to our main characters. And the first that, that I, well, it's actually not the first we'll talk about, we're gonna talk about another one first, but is Ernest Francisco Fenelosa, who is an American art historian and Japanese art professor of philosophy and political economy at Tokyo Imperial University. And the next one is, of course, William Sturgis Bigelow, who was a prominent American collector of Japanese art. He was one of the first Americans to live in Japan and helped to form the standards by which Japanese art and culture were appreciated in the West. Bigelow and Fenelosa were the first Westerners who are recorded to have taken Tendai Buddhist vows, and we'll examine them more closely. When we look at William Sturgis Bigelow, and there's a, a quote there, and it's an interesting quote because it has a real sense of Buddhist modernism built into it. And so, but you see also his notion of, of um, 
rebirth, his notion of karma, his notion of uh, how they work together, and interpenetration all in one paragraph. Consciousness is continuous, therefore there is but one ultimate consciousness. All beings, therefore, are one, are therefore one. And when one man strikes another, he strikes all men, including himself. Just when and where and how, in terms of space and time, he feels his own blows depends on circumstances. But sooner or later, he will. A good deed comes back to the doer in the same way. Bigelow was from a well-known aristocratic Boston family. He graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1874 and continued his medical education in Europe, where he studied bacteriology under Louis Pasteur. After returning to Boston and practicing surgery at the Massachusetts General Hospital for two years, however, he became restless. Displeased with medicine and his life in Boston, in 1882, he traveled to Boston with Edward Morris. There, they joined Ernest Fenelosa to form a, a Boston triumvirate of apostles of Japanese art and culture. Bigelow remained in Japan for seven years to study Buddhism, a study that would continue for the remainder of his life. In 1908, the Ingersoll Lecture at Harvard University was published as Buddhism and Immortality. Even before his seven-year residence in Japan, Bigelow had begun to amass an enormous collection of Japanese art. Going back to the section of the Meiji period, Buddhist temples had sold off much of their artifacts for a fraction of their actual worth. So he was actually able to pick up what are now considered treasures for really a pittance. As a result of the determination of Fenelosa and Morris, as well as their special authorizations under the Japanese government, Nicolo was able to explore parts of Japan closed to outside viewers for centuries. One of the things I wanted to just mention in relation to the Meiji period was that on one hand, Japan was sending many people abroad to Germany, England, France, Spain, US, Canada, etc to learn how those countries had modernized things like the police force, their military, their school systems, their hospitals, etc. And at the same time, they had invited many people to Japan uh, from those countries in order to advise them on how to best modernize. Japan had to modernize within a short period of time. And so Bigelow, coming from a prominent Boston family, as well as Fenelosa, as we'll learn, were, and being scholars, and being people who had been well-respected within their societies, became valuable to the Japanese government, providing insight into Western modernization. The group visited the Shosoin treasure house of Todaiji, viewing hidden treasures of Emperor Shomo, Shomyu, and being granted a few shards of pottery. The only items belong, belonging to the show, so in known to currently reside outside of Japan are at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Among the many other items he obtained during the time in Japan were a set of gift bronze statues from Horyuji of the historical Buddha and his tenants known as the Shaka Trinity statues and mandala from Hokado, Hokedo Lotus Sutra Hall of Todaiji, one of the oldest Jewish Japanese paintings to ever leave Japan. And just so that you're aware of this, uh, if you go to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, you'll see the Shaka uh, Trio, the Trinity, that's displayed there in a temple-like setting, as well as the mandala. So you can go there today, and they're still in a prominent position in the museum. So while in Japan, after his return to the United States, he organized exhibitions of traditional Japanese art as he continued his study of art and religion. Through his exhibitions, writings, and especially the donations of his immense personal collection of Japanese art, more than 15,000 pieces as well as 40,000 ukiyo-e prints were, get, were donated to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston in, in uh, 1911. His efforts, along with those, uh, those of Morris, Fenelosa, Charles Goddard-Weld, Okakura, and a handful of others, 
made the newly founded Department of Art of Asia at the Museum of Foreign Arts the largest collection of Japanese arts anywhere outside of Japan, and this is a distinction that it still holds today. His influence on Western West's knowledge of Japan, of Japan cannot be overstated. Further, as mentioned in the handout, handout on September 1st, 1885, William Sturgis Bigelow and Ernest Van Losa took Buddhist vows at the sub-temple Homyo Inn within the Tendai Monastery of Miyadera at the foot of Mount Tie on Lake Biwa near Kyoto. Their teacher was Sakurai Heitoko Ajari, whom Bigelow later nursed through his final illness. Bigelow was devoted to his Buddhist practice. In 1888, he took part in a lay ordination at Homyo Inn. Thus, he, along with Ernest Fenelosa, were the first Westerners to take Tendai Buddha's vows, and Bigelow was the first to be ordained. Next. <coughs> Ernest Francisco Fenelosa was an art historian, professor of philosophy and political economy, the curator of Asian art. He was a son of Manuel Fenelosa, classically trained Spanish musician, and Mary Silsby, a member of the prominent family in Boston, Massachusetts. After graduating from Harvard in 1874, Fenelosa studied philosophy and divinity at Cambridge University before he enrolled in the Art School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. His studies and travels and his quick fluency in Japanese and later Chinese brought in wide acquaintance with Buddhist monks and teachers. As previously noted, he, along with Bigelow, took Buddhist vows at the sub-temple Omyoin in 1885. Because of Japan's intense efforts to catch up with the West and the government's edict to separate Shinto from Buddhism, traditional Japanese arts lost much of their prestige, and many art treasures were thrown out and even burned as garbage. And this persuaded Fenelosa to focus his efforts on traditional arts and to halt the dismantling and destruction of art collections and the discarding of traditional art technique. While completing the first inventory of Japan's national treasures, Fenelosa discovered ancient Chinese scrolls that had been brought to Japan century early, centuries earlier, probably in the 6th century. This finding inspired him to study Chinese art and calligraphy, and he eventually concluded Japanese and Chinese paintings emerged from the same aesthetic tradition. In 1886, Fenelosa and his friend, an art critic, Okakura Takuzo, were commissioned by the government to tour Europe studying methods of teaching and preserving the fine arts. As Fenelosa left temporarily for the United States, the Emperor Meiji said to him, quote, You have taught my people to know their own art and charged him to teach it to Americans. After returning to Tokyo, Fenelosa helped to found in 1887 the Tokyo Fine Arts School and to draft a law for the preservation of temples and shrines and their art treasures. This was incredibly important. Many temples and shrines and their, tre and their treasures had been preserved and restored as a result of this act. Fenelosa returned to the United States in 1890 to serve as curator of of Oriental Arts at the MFA. And during his tenure, he organized MFA's first ex exhibition of Chinese paintings. He significantly advanced the study of Asian art in the United States and published East and West, The Discovery of America and Other Poems in 1893, and Masters of Ukiyo-e in 1896, among other works. Fenelosa sold his own art collection to Charles Goddard Weld with the condition that it would eventually go to the MFA thus endowing the museum with one of the first significant Asian art collections. In 1895, Fenelosa was ousted from his position. Well, we won't talk about the scandal of the results, but he returned to Japan in 1897 as a professor of English literature, only returned to the United States three years later. His important work was already recognized in his own time, and Emperor Meiji decorated him with several of the orders of Japanese Empire. Next. As you can read on the handout, Bigelow's ashes were divided, and half are in the Mount Auburn Cemetery outside Boston, where his father, Jacob, 
the cemetery his father Jacob founded. And interestingly enough, his, his father Jacob was also a physician, and he founded that cemetery. It was one of the first in the United States huge, to be located outside the city because he was the first to advocate that a cemetery could, could maintain pathogens and should therefore be located outside the city center. That was one of the first uh, the first cemeteries to do that. Um, so half of his ashes were in the Mount Auburn Cemetery. It was actually in what, Watertown and Cambridge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think. It's right yeah. in between. In, in between. I mean, it's ginormous. It's great. Yeah. I mean, and great. half at Homyo Inn in Otsu, Shiga Prefecture, at the base of Mount Tie in Japan. While all fen Fenelosa's cremains are inured at Homyo Homo Homo Inn, I think it speaks to the esteem in which Fenelosa was held that the Meiji Tenno, the emperor, had his ashes returned to Japan by a military vessel. Jan Natier wrote, religions, not just Buddhism, travel in three major ways, as import, as export, and as baggage. In the 19th century, <laughs> I, I love I love that. <laughs> in the 19th century, Asian immigrants to North America brought Buddhism with them as baggage, as important as an important component of their culture. And there are North Americans, such as Walt Whitman and Henry David Thoreau, who were attracted to Eastern philosophy and Buddhism. Some people may remember that Henry David Thoreau actually translated from Sanskrit parts of the Lotus Sutra. And Walt Whitman was considered by the Buddhists at that time, and there, there were a small number of, of non-Asian Buddhists at that time, as the first American bodhisattva he was referred to. Um, however, they didn't have teachers who could instruct them in practice. Thus, it was not widely observed, that is, Buddhism was not widely observed outside of the Asian communities. Vigolo and Fenelosa were attracted to and practiced Buddhism a number of years before the world's parliament of religion, which convened in Chicago as part of the 1893 World's Fair, formally introduced Buddhism to non-Asian populations. They definitely imported Buddhism to North America before Buddhism was on the radar of most Americans. The question might remain, why they chose Tendai rather than one of the Zen, Dorlan schools, Nichiren, etc. According to Christopher Reed, uh, Bigelow dismissed Zen and Shin Buddhism, referring to the latter as a very big and popular, easygoing sect, the Salvation Army of Buddhism. <laughs> I suspect that the cultural tradition, the hierarchy, the art, and ritual of Tendai appeal to this nature. To answer the question, why is this important, is that it takes, it places Tendai firmly into the fabric of North American Buddhism even before North America knew it had Buddhism, in ways that few people recognize or even know about. Thank you. And now? Um, and Ichishima Sensei, did, did, would you like to say a few words about either Bigelow or Fenelosa, since I originally learned about them from you? There you okay. Go. Yes. Well, thank you for your wonderful presentation today for Fenelosa and uh, Bigelow. And you actually visited the uh, Homyo in temple where the ashes of the uh, tomb there of Bigero and Penrosa. And uh, I think uh, Bigero really contributed a lot, especially to introduce uh, meditation to Western countries uh, in terms of uh, he presented uh, <coughs> translation of the uh, meditation by GE. Uh, uh, to Harvard University, the Harvard Theological Review, uh, volume uh, 16, April 1923, number two. Uh, and the title is On the Method of Practicing Concentration and uh, Contemplation, Chigi. And uh, his, uh, I think, the introduction was very interesting to understand his fellow. Uh, Tenshin Okakura, Okakura Kakuzo, uh, they are good friends. Uh, so, Penorosa, Bigero, and uh, Okakura, they usually uh, have a time to uh, uh, take a ch Japanese tea in the Homyo in temple. There is a very wonderful uh, chashitsu, 
uh, the tea room where they discussed uh, very frankly about the Japanese culture and Western culture together. And when first I visited uh, that Homyoin temple and their tombs, I fortunately, uh, <coughs> abbot of the temple, uh, Shigeno, really invited me and uh, like a best friend. And we uh, talked along <laughs> with him and he tried to serve me tea, but uh, there it was not enough to boil the water. So Ichimasu said, would you have uh, drinks <laughs> of sake? And uh, we really enjoyed the time uh, spending there. And they, uh, also maybe you, uh, Monshi introduced the pictures of the their tomb and the left side uh, in the, today's presentation, there is a uh, tomb and uh, some uh, writing there. But so I just memorized uh, the uh, description of the uh, tomb. So let me, is it all right to read just a few minutes? To read? Yeah. It says, here and in his native land, America, lie the ashes of William Sturgis Bigero, a follower of the Buddha known in religion as Geshin Koji, Moonlight, uh, Geshin Koji, a pupil of Sakurai Ajari, a supporter of Homyoin, a doctor of medicine, a lover and collector of the fine arts of Japan, a recipient of the Order of the Rising Sun. His life was distinguished by high thoughts and good deeds, by understanding and by the gift of the sympathy. He was everywhere beloved and honored most by those who knew him best. April 4th, 4th 1815, uh, 1850, October the 6th, 1926. So I think this is very interesting. So I just took a note when I visited uh, the, the tomb. So it was very nice presentation. And uh, especially, I think uh, Geshin, uh, uh, William Studies Vigero, uh, asked uh, Okakura Tenshin to translate Japanese documents, especially uh, GE's translation of the uh, Tendai Shoshikan. Uh, so I think uh, he was really a contributor to spread the uh, Tendai Buddhism to the West, I think. That is my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sensei. I appreciate that. And, and I have to say that Shimon and I had visited um, Homyo <coughs> A number of years ago, we visited the the temple and the and the graves, and they they preserved one of the rooms there as it was when a Bigelow lived there. So there's still a settee and a globe and a telescope and some other materials that were owned by Bigelow at that time, and you can still go there and you can see them. It's a it's a very small little temple, and it's. Yeah. But it's not far off of one of the main streets in Otsu. It's just a short walk, maybe. What do you think, Sensei? Maybe 15 or 20 minute walk from the main street in oh. Otsu? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you ever get to Japan, you get to Otsu near Mount TA, you get to Miyadera, it's well worth your well worth the chance to just go and visit. Um, and and you will be welcome because there's so few people that actually go there to visit. <laughs> You'll be treated like a celebrity, I guarantee it. <laughs> Any other did questions? You, yeah, did please. you meet uh, Shigeno-san, abbot of the temple at that time when you visited? No, temple? I don't recall. Maybe Shumon oh. remembers. I don't recall. Oh, I see. That oh. was probably about, um, I'm going to say, 10 or 12 years ago that we visited. Mm -hmm. I see. Unfortunately, he passed away, and so, but uh, he was very nice person and uh, really uh, loved people. I think. Thank you. Thank you. This evening, the contemplation I used for the vipassana comes from the Kuzoshi, a Zen phrase anthology. 
It was completed in the 15th century by Toyo Icho Zenji, a descendant of the founder of Myohojinji in Kyoto and Myohojinji School of Rinzai Zen. The questions are taken from Chinese Chan ancestors, Confucian texts, Taoist writings, Chinese poets. And the current title of the work is Zendin Kushu. There's no complete translation in English. What one finds are fragments. D.T. Suzuki, Ishimura, Sasaki, and others often include some of these aphorisms and, and phrases and works. But there's no complete collection. Sort of a tease. And it's what I like about it. Because I come across these phrases at, at random. They're found here and there. And they allow one to, to explore the depths of East Asian wisdom in a non-intellectual fashion. They're not a koan. Everyone knows the koans, which are often paradoxical questions, exchanges between two people, and they're used as an aid in meditation, koans that is, and they may lead to satori, awakening at a profound level. Rather, the phrases may be molded in the mind, even one's subconscious. I mean, that's the difference. The, the koan, one approaches it, one allows it to work, but it's a non-solvable riddle, so to speak. There are answers you can find in the blueprint with records. That's the most famous exposition on koans. But realistically, you know, an example of a koan would be, um, does the dog does a dog have a Buddha nature? And the respond is woo. That would be an example of a koan and the response. But that's just one person's response to that particular koan. Koans don't always have this. You don't come up with the same answer. And often the answer is to get up and run away outside the <laughs> <laughs> the meeting with the, with the Roshi. No, these are a little bit different. These really work in a way that explore as opposed to just deepen one's meditation in order to seek awakening. So we don't have a full contemplation. And finding them is serendipitous. Stumbling across them when one least expects it makes them seem even more mysterious and mystical. That's what I like about them. We live in an age when information is so easy to come by. I'm not going to ask you to pull out your small handheld computer that has more computing power than the Apollo capsules that went to the moon. And you can find out almost anything except what is the meaning of life, but you already know the answer to that according to. So, all this information is just a couple of keystrokes away. Recently, Shimon and I were watching a PBS series on writing. Did anybody else happen to see that series? It's really fascinating. If you have an opportunity, find it and watch it. It's on writing. And, in that, it told us that when books were handwritten by scribes, meaning, you know, back in the Dark Ages, so to speak, um, and the, the, the of these manuscripts were beautiful. They were, they were absolutely magnificent, whether it, was in, whether it was in English or German or Arabic or you know, Chinese calligraphy, whatever it may be, the calligraphy that, that went into making them. Absolutely beautiful. Each book I learned in this would be worth 
in today's terms, the cost of a middle class house. One book would be equivalent in cost to a middle class house today. Just think about that. And then printing with Google type, which was invented by the Chinese in the ninth century, the first scroll was the Diamond Sutra. Think about that. The first movable type scroll was the Diamond Sutra from Buddhism. You're okay to wait for another 600 years before Gutenberg came along to produce movable type press. Once we had movable type and we had printing presses, There was a radical reorganization of the way people attained knowledge. Books became less expensive by a magnitude. Now, back then, 1400 years ago, they were still pretty pricey. Only elites could afford them, but then again, only the elites could read. So that's the way that was, right? Today, information is less expensive. Again, by magnitude. How many times am, do, am I confronted with the issue of there's a translation that we want to do of a book, but if I order the book, it's going to cost me $80. But I can get a PDF for free. All I got to do is download it and print it out. Right? We all have experienced that. And nobody says, is the book a better translation or a better version? No, the PDF is free. The book is going to cost me $80. I'm just using an example here, right? That may be one of the reasons why there's such a distrust of formal institutional knowledge. Because information today is so cheap even relatively free. And that which is cheap is not valued. It's free, it is suspect. Yet, opinions and conspiracies are now exalted by many people at the same time. So back to the Zen phrase anthology. Stumbling upon these verses, and you might if you read in Buddhist materials, which some will find, they might not even be attributed to the Zen phrase anthology. But you'll stumble upon them in unexpected places, and that's what makes them seem much more priceless, because it's something that you came upon, that you weren't expecting it, and now you can struggle with it, if you will. Mm -hmm. Sitting with them in meditation can uncover a layer of the ineffable, and assist one in a Kensho state. A Kensho is usually translated as seeing one's true nature. That is, the Buddha nature or the nature of the mind. So be aware of the many opportunities that are available to peel away the veils that cover over the nature of reality, the transcendence of the provisional to the absolute. Spot.